Welcome everyone back to Shiftcast. We got episode eight here, and today is a special show. Obviously, we have Michael and Yens as normal, but we have some of the top Cougars here today. We have Coach Gregan and Player Relating Wave. Gregan, how are you feeling this uh, evening for you, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. We've just had a nice little break after the first split. I think we worked incredibly hard, so I think we all needed a bit of a break. And uh, actually, it's the first time me and Wave have spoken in about yeah. uh, a week, pretty much since the, the, the final day of RLCS, right, Wave? Yeah, about that. Yeah, so we spoke we've, after it, so... Yeah, we've enjoyed uh, a little break off and ready to come back for a split two. That's right. And uh, uh, before we jumped in here, Wave and, and Greg, and as he said, they were chatting a little bit. And Wave, you've had a little bit of downtime this week. Is that right? Well, I think that's what you, like, you need to make the most of, like, the downtime yep. that we have. Like, I mean, I was I was lucky throughout, like, last year not having to play one of the splits. But since having tryouts, I've had, like, a week off since September. Yeah. It's and definitely it's something that I think... <sighs> I don't want to say it's like taken for granted, but we kind of miss it as consumers. We don't realize how on that you guys are all the time. Like there's just no time to breathe, whether it's tryouts or, you know, I um, mean, we'll jump into this, but like uh, Greg and say, y'all been grinding hard, but y'all had a little bit of a, a rough start there. And I'm sure you probably doubled down after that to uh, regain and, and put yourself back into a good position. So with that said, let's just um, jump right into it. I guess we'll ignore how Yens and Michael are doing. We don't really care about those guys. Um, but <laughs> This offseason, Wave talks about tryouts. So let's just go to him first. Um, talk to us a little bit about the process of forming top Cougars. How did you come a, a, across these two players? And then, um, you know, you can talk about Gregan as well, and then we'll, give, we'll let him have the floor to discuss his side of things as well. I mean, like, there's not – like, normally when you go for a tryout phase, there's a lot to it. Um, yeah. I was a bit lucky with not having to deal with – the spring split last year because of um, legal things to do with contracts. And so I, I knew what I wanted like straight away. I knew it, like people were playing it. I was sorting what I wanted in March and I knew that I wanted that crow like from the get go. Mm -hmm. And toxic, toxic as well was one of the players that was like floating around. He asked me, but we never went with him at the start. And then, we, we started trying out with him. We were trying out with a fair few people and it kind of just clicked straight away. I think it was only about four or five scrims until we just decided, yeah, let's do it. So, so when was this? This was about end of August, start of September time. And then we right. formed at the end of September. And you said you felt really confident about Acro. Is there anything in specific or you just like how he plays, like him as a person and thought he'd be a good teammate or... I, I yeah, I think it's just good for me. Like every, people have like certain teammates that they play with like better, yeah. and I, I think that was just what I wanted from the start. I saw him play on Guild. I saw him play even before that, and he just looked like a good player. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So uh, then, obviously, you three meet up, got your your squad set, and then obviously you add Gregan into the mix as well. So how does that come about? Did you reach out to him? Is that something where he hunt you guys down, or or talk me through that as well? Well, we like first spoke through another tryout because he was doing some stuff with Gom, but I okay. was trying out with them like every now and then anyway because I had to keep my options open. But then once we formed, we were on the coach hunt, and I think Gregan was like the third or fourth person that we like asked to try out, not to actually like be our coach, but yeah, yeah. Um, and then, like, things were going. Coach Charles took a long time for no reason, but then we decided to go with him. There was nothing really, like, special. It's just it works best, sure. best for us. Yeah. Was it always a matter of we need to have a coach? Because there's teams yeah, there. that go without. I don't think it was more of a need. It was definitely more of a, like, I, I really would prefer one. Mm -hmm. Because you can have a lot of troubles without... And I, I think it's hard to gain ground in replays and other scenarios without a coach because yeah, like, otherwise sense. you otherwise it can feel very biased mm -hmm. like yeah. if someone says something and then you don't you never have like a second opinion you just say what you want which can obviously be good but from my experiences can be bad as well yeah, yeah. so greg in there from you pick up from there then um obviously they ran some tryouts and whatnot and he said it felt felt really good but talk to me about it from your side yeah i mean um after the tryout and it being successful i sort of remember back to me and wave chatting at worlds last last year as well 
and uh, he was talking about his experiences with with teams and coaches and what he would want. And I was talking about what I'd want out of a player. And there was that sort of moment where I remember thinking, do you know what? I would quite like to coach this guy because he sounds like <laughs> yeah. the kind of player I'd love to work with. Uh, and that has been proven right um, all the time I've worked with Wave. And I think after the, the sort of GOM trials didn't work out, I remember messaging Wave being like, look, I really want to work with GOM, but, you know, obviously... Uh, I want to keep my options open. And, and if you do want to do a tryout at some point, I'd love to do a tryout. Um, and I was very thankful when they did do the tryout. Um, and then it was actually on my birthday. They they called me up. I was out at a Pokemon event in Poland and I got a call from Wave and he was like, so um, we're going to go with you as coach. Uh, or, or I think it was like, if you are if you want to join us, we'd like to have yeah. you as coach. Like Wave always the whole time was like, he didn't want to act like he was the guy who, uh, I needed. He was always like, look, if you want to join us, then then we'll be willing to have you. Um, and I think a lot of it just came down to like personalities working well together. And that's been, honestly, from my point of view, my favorite thing about this team is you've got um, Toxic, Wave and Acro, who they, they themselves hang out all the time. And that's something like every coach dreams of. And then also the fact that one-to-one, -one, we all get on really well. As a team, we all get on really well. We're all willing to talk our, our, our thoughts out. And that's something that um, I think it's definitely helped us through those tougher times, like when we didn't make the first regional, uh, the first top 16 for the qualifier. Um, and I think it's it's players like Wave who uh, the unspoken side of what makes them such a good player is the fact they're willing to say, I don't like the way we're playing. We need to try this. Let's talk about this, that kind of thing. So, yeah, it's, it's honestly like ever since I joined, it's just been one of my favorite teams to work with and, and also a new experience not being part of an org whilst coaching. So the whole thing's been been amazing. Yeah, um, I mean, we can kind of move into that quickly. Uh, so obviously, you guys are pretty highly rated by other European teams going in uh, to the first open qualifier. Had a little bit of a, a bump in the road there. Weren't able to make it. And I mean, we saw with a lot of teams, we see it every year, uh, every split, that teams have some height. They don't perform in that first uh, qualifier, regional, whatever. And then it feels like they just drop out and they can never recover. Um, and I, so I, I wanted to ask, you know, both of you, um, just from a player standpoint, and a coach standpoint, what the climb back is to not just chalk it in your mind or try to make sure your teammates don't chalk it or your players don't chalk it and really like focus when, you know, the sort of goal that you had in the beginning of the mind, maybe to make the major suddenly seems like it's a million miles away. Do you want to go ahead, Wave? You can go first. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest with you, the new format definitely is challenging for teams, firstly, that are low seeded. So, for example, we were seed 15 going in, and I think the teams that are in that 13 to 19 range uh, early on had a lot more challenging a run because you're expected to beat one of the top teams in the upper. And if you don't beat them, you then go and play another team that's been roughly seeded. So for us, we obviously played Vitality in the upper. And, and I'll be honest with you, if we played the level that we're capable of, we probably should have won that because um, Vitality weren't playing very well. You know, Alpha had some tech issues. So uh, in hindsight, we definitely could have won that. But still, we got to beat Vitality. And then we went down and played Sir. And I think Sir were an under-seeded team, having Tekos on the team, you know, an up-and-coming player. Um, and sure. obviously still a very good, very good team. They're seeded low, so we have to play them to make it. And the fact that either us or Sir didn't make it showed that the system... Uh, didn't quite work there. Um, and I think that was the same case for teams like 100% uh, and and so on. Like Tea Time beat Sir and then didn't make it. So there's a lot of teams around that area that, that are going to struggle. And then once you get stuck within that region, it becomes very difficult to break out because you, you play against a top four seed to make it through the upper, um, having beaten a team at a similar seed to you. And then if you drop down to the lows, you have to play another team at similar seed to you. So you have to win two games against a similar seeded team uh, or um, win a game against similar seeded team and beat a top four seeded team. And that's the only way you can make it through the open qualifier system. Uh, so I think it, it was really rough for us at the start, especially with those two misseeded teams above us pushing us down. I think that really changed our run. So that was that. Um, uh, and to be honest, we should have beaten Sir. We should have beaten Vitality. That's on us. And then that's that sort of brings us on to the second point, which is a lack of experience for... Um, less developed players like Acro and Toxic who haven't had that chance to play at the top as much. Um, because if you look at uh, the amount of games played under pressure in RLCS now with the open qualifier into the top 16, if you don't make an event or if you even if you do make an event, you, you drop out early, the amount of matches you get to play is so much lower. 
So I think we've been fighting against the lack of experience in a high pressure situation this whole time. And, and as we saw towards the end, we started to really show what we we're capable of beating teams like BDS and Magnifico. But then that's where some <laughs> other seeding issues and <laughs> getting upsets in in um, in Swiss is actually bad for you sometimes. And so, yeah, we, we've just been fighting against that the whole time. Um, and I think had there been something like that top 16 qualifier Swiss, then I could see us as being a team that could have made it through that that then or you know, with the closed qualifiers, gaining experience through those, I think we could have been a team that had that chance to make a top eight, a top four, just with more more reps in. But it was only we started getting our rhythm towards uh, the end of the, the the split. How was that for you, Wave? Because Gregan talks about experience and you've got a lot of experience. I'm not going to call you old because I'm five years older than you. Uh, you're 21. You pick up two guys who aren't the youngest rookies themselves, right? They're both 19. Um, how is it to be leading those guys? Or do you feel like you're a little bit of a re leadership role there? Yeah, I think, I mean, I can, I think, I think there is like a degree of like leadership you can have. I think it's harder for these two because they aren't as experienced. I'm not like, I think the age thing is a little bit like weird. I, I, I don't think age really matters too much. It like experience can, but I think with like what we found was that while we did have like a rough first regional that was also not our fault to a degree sure because uh, you've seen in the format like you're allowed you can have a bad day right but obviously you saw what moist in regional two and then that that like whole bracket we were in that bracket as well there was like resolve there was uh, solary was so solary there was us there was moist and like only two of those teams could go through and then, uh, like at that point, you look at it, you look at the bracket, and you think, "Well, hang on, how how does that work?" And you see in another <laughs> one, there's like two, like not even top sixteen teams playing each other mm -hmm. for it, and it's thinking. And then, but that's like the problem with this new double or limb. Like it can reward upsets, and it really does. It's good for it, but it, it just doesn't give the best teams. And I think that's what happened to us in the first one. While we could have played better, yeah. Uh, we didn't, and that's just what happened that day. Um, just quickly, in terms of the format, you know, the format didn't do you guys uh, any favors in the third open qualifier either. So, you know, you played all five teams you played were in contention for LAN at that point or had clinched LAN. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this is actually a question I've always wanted to ask a professional coach, whatever. <laughs> Obviously, the Swiss is probably much – it's a kind of a strange experience because you don't really get to prep for who you play. You just kind of are on a whim like, all right, we're playing these guys, go. So what's the feeling? Is there almost like a feeling of like humor when like that something like that happens? You get to round four and you get to round five and you're like, oh, my God, we're not getting one team that's like – not like false hard sweating for the major today like what was that experience like <laughs> go ahead wave <laughs> it, it's like it, so i mean i've kind of been in like a similar situation to it like before obviously on a different team but it's it's funny because you're like oh my god can we please get a break like how have we been given this and at the same time you're thinking like what else can you do you've won like you you've made some upsets or something and you've just been rewarded with harder games even yeah. though you might have lost or you won and it's like i i think swiss is my favorite format but it's so like not rewarding for upsets on like the like double limb bracket where you win a game you go so much further yeah i think it works better on land the way they do it with like a three-day format so at least for like most of the games you actually get to like know who you're playing the night before but some of these yeah. like long yeah. swiss days you're like yeah you gotta you you win two two series that would be considered upsets and your prize is playing vitality the world champions mm -hmm. it's, it's incredible crazy. but it must be exhausting like, too right so oh, absolutely yeah it must be exhausting oh to yeah such a day it was also there was some tech issues so i think it was one of the longest mm -hmm. swiss days we've had in a while um and, but like the biggest exhaustion i think was um just being against those top teams and then like realizing that you're going to get swept by them right like the vitality game we had i think the first game was close and then the second game they settled in it's like every single game that happens like that you're like okay right 
let's think about the next one. But then because we know we've got one of the worst possible records, go winning three two, three two, losing three nil, you're then like, well, we're probably gonna have a tough match in the next one. And because we've upset some teams, that means we've sent some good teams down, That's and that right. means there's gonna be more upsets and so on and so on. Um, and to be honest, like it, it's on us. Like we should have beaten Oxygen. And like, let's be honest, if we if we ran that gauntlet of five of the top six teams and beat Oxygen, that would have been incredible. But then ultimately, if we if we won that, I think we would have played Carmen Corp in the quarters. Yeah. So we would have literally played all six of the top six teams. It's unreal. Um, so and that that comes down to firstly upsets. You don't get rewarded unless you do a three zero upset, which let's be honest is really hard to do. Um, and then also you get punished for going through the upper side because your the, the the second differentiator after game difference is your seed and because we go in as a low seed because there is no physical way for us to get higher than the 14th seed unless we upset in the open qualifier we're, we're then 14th seed locked for the rest of that swiss so anytime they can choose between two teams we're always going to be the lower team so we're just always going to get pushed against harder teams so again this is this is the main reason why that closed qualifier was so good was because it allowed teams in that 9 through 24 range to reshuffle. Um, and so that meant we got more true seeding throughout the season. Um, whereas at the moment, teams like us, you know, like not only are we having to play these top teams in the open qualifier stuff I mentioned before, but then going into the Swiss, our first round is always going to be a hard matchup. So you don't even get those, you know, potential 3 0 round one. It's like the whole system just becomes so much more difficult for the, the 13th to 19th seeded teams. Um, yeah. And, and, and Arceus definitely, definitely doesn't use that. the Buchholz system, right? No. Because that would actually change the seeding within the Swiss format, I mean, which would actually allow you to upset a team and have an advantage from it. Yeah, and get, is it, you gain their seed, right, in that situation? Yeah, yeah. at least so, yeah. Or it's Whereas, like, yeah, they're like built, it's like built in so that whoever has the more quality wins based on initial seeding plays whoever has the more quality like the, the least quality yeah. wins so if you beat the one seed you play the team that got the win over the lowest possible so yeah i guess that yeah. or something like that right i see so yeah if you get a quality win you're going to play against a team that's had a less quality win so if someone's had an easier run yeah theory, and they get matched up with and that kind of mat i guess that would kind of equal out form where it's like if a team's kind of like <laughs> slipping over lesser teams and one team's just dominating came in on, on a flamethrower. Um, but I'm not sure the exact specifics of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, if, if we end up breaking out of the, I think we're, we're now 13th seed or 14th, something like that. So like we're climbing slowly, but you know, with a two split format, it's really hard to climb out of that. Um, and like, there's every possibility that we have a, a great run in regional one, uh, in in qualifier one, sorry, I keep calling regionals. In qualifier one, um, next split, and then we jump our CD up, and then we're ninth seed or something. But then you know we could have a great split too. But it's just it honestly, it, it feels like we're fighting against the system um, because of that low seed open qualifier run being challenging, and then the start of the the Swiss being so challenging. But yeah. but equally, we we had a really good seeding going into the second split after getting the upset in the open qualifier, and we didn't take advantage of it. So, you know, it's easy to say all this, but then we lost our first round match, which we probably should have been um, should have been winning in the in the, the second qualifier. Yeah. It's always tough because like the people that are live experiencing it, it's very easy to write them off because it just feels like an excuse to everyone else. Do you know what I mean? Like people will hear it and they'll be like, oh, it doesn't matter, just win. Uh, but there are legitimate concerns and, and, and things that I think could definitely be altered to, you know, provide a better product across the board. And it's not just one team. I mean, you've named off a few there. Resolve, Rebellion goes top four in NA. We see a similar situation. We had Omelette, which ended up being a top 10-ish team by the end of things. And listen, they missed out in Regional 1. In Regional 2, they lost in Day 1. And didn't, this is all... Omelette in Regional 1, didn't they have TSM and OG in their bracket or something like that because of the misseeding of TSM? I think that's right. TSM I think, yeah. and Shopify, TSM. I believe it was. Yeah. Because uh, OG played uh, Cam's team and almost lost to them. I remember but that. But this, this, you know, this is a big... Yeah. It's not just the Swiss, and it's not just the Open Qualifier... And it's not just the two. It's like all these things combined together to make it very challenging as a full system to, like you said, drag yourself up. If you do have one yeah. bad day, that like specifically really for a team like Top Cougars, right? That's right. Because so, there's yeah. going to be teams at they're, the top who. I just want to say that because the like 
there are going to be people mm -hmm. that hear it and they're going to be just angry that, you know, they just want to say just win. But there are legitimate concerns um, for for these teams. So, yeah, that shouldn't uh, be we, it for sure. We did just win and then we got punished for it. <laughs> just, <laughs> you beat, you beat too true. many good teams that is and true. then you accidentally. Yeah, <laughs> there's. But um, well, let's unlucky. let's jump to the next topic here. We've got uh, we want to ask you guys both about the state of UK Rocket League. And then um, afterwards, I, I want you guys to elaborate a little bit on your opinion uh, towards why the Francophone countries have done so well in Europe. And then, uh, you know, as a third piece to that, how can we, you know, how, how do you see or what is a way for the UK scene to climb their way back up to be, um, you know, competitive with or even on top of the French at the moment? Oh, there's a lot, lots of breakdowns. There's a lot there. there. Let's do this. Let's do this. Yeah, we'll start go with wave. the first one. Talk to me a little bit about the state of the UK scene, some of the players, and, and what is your opinion about um, the UK scene for professional Rocket League at the moment? Where are we at? I think, I think the UK scene is like weird because the the problem that American fans have with the French players is that they don't have any sort of connection to them. Like they don't, they yeah. can't speak to them. All the right. French players stream in French, so what ha what that means is then all the UK players get looked at as the American ones, and obviously it makes it obviously. Uh, well, you've seen how like what three or four European players now go over to NA, non yeah. being French conveniently, <laughs> but like it, the UK scene, it, it's good, but we don't do it in the right way. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, we're definitely the second country to the to the French, like just based off of uh, quality of players. Like you've got Joyo, we've got Oski, we've got Rise, we've got. Um, I mean, more, some of those UK players. Yeah, Appjack, Nolly. You know, like there, there's so many good players. Obviously, we've got our team is is a UK team, uh, and I think and and like Ixo, Archie. Like you start naming them, and you realize how many there are that are, mm -hmm. are high quality players. And I think the, the biggest difference, in my opinion, is the structure that the French scene has created for themselves has pushed them to rise to the top. Um, because firstly, they have a much more professional setup um, and the orgs that are supporting them. Um, it's a much more like passion based support system, right? Like the Vitality players really want to play for Vitality. The KC players right. really want to play for KC um, and, and so on. And like the BDS system, you know, you've got Monkey Moon, he's part of the system um and like the uk players are playing for american orgs right like we've got moist and we've got oxygen yeah. um and so they're boot camping at places like endpoint rather than boot camping in a hq of their own org where they get to meet all these people so like the level of professionalism push passion support that the french players get i think Get, makes them do that extra hour makes them yeah. um have those hard discussions makes them push themselves to the next level and then of course once they start pushing themselves they rise to the top and then it's about maintaining right mm -hmm. and and i think the history with kdop and, and everything like that where they they had that uh inspiration early on with one of the best players in the world i think there's a lot of things that have risen on the top and then the org and um community in france has really helped them stay at the top um through that work right that's interesting. Wave, sorry, I, just a question for Wave. So when you were teaming with Seiko, did you notice anything about the way he interacted with people in the French scene that may have, that kind of stuck out to you uh, related to what Greg is saying with the structure? Uh, just within like the community, not just within the orgs, or is that not something that you like saw out of him just because it was like his own thing? No, not really. I'll, like, I'll, at the start, he was a bit more of an outcast. Like I think he was still friends with, with a couple of them. I think he might have been friends with like Vatira, and that might have been it. Like when we picked him up, I, I can't recall him being friends with any of the French pros. Obviously, it changed after the first split because we got <laughs> good. But like, it, it, it just it it this is the environment that these French players have is to a higher standard, it, and it helps that the French players like each other most of the time, and the UK players don't get on very well. Right. Great, That's great, another great thing, yeah. 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 So, so what do you guys think? So, you think you would say that the number one reason, if if the UK were to get on par with France or even go above France, because they're 
you know, to, to what Greg was saying, I believe in a couple of the qualifiers, there were actually more British players than there were French players. All the French players just kind of like compiled at the top. Um, but do you think that the stru- it's the structure and sort of the environment that is the biggest thing that if, you know, the UK scene wants to get back onto the top with those French players, it's going to be through kind of no more infighting and like more kind of structure on the community level? I, th- I think it's as simple as they just work harder. I I, I think I think in general a lot of British players outside of Jack Joyo and Oski have not been grinding as hard as they arguably could have, and that like that's something we've always <laughs> struggled with. And obviously the French players are a bit different. Like they they generally tend to have like an extra hour a day or whatever, which in in the long run does stack up. Yeah. yeah. I think you see it in other esports as well, right? Like, I think the French can, if they latch on to an esport and they believe they can be one of the best in that community, they'll they'll put the passion um, hours in that take them to the next level. And, and I think it's also, it's fair to say that since the open era started, um, obviously there was some French representation before the open era, so they've always been there. But I think since the open era, we've really seen players rise to the top and stay at the top. Um, and I think that was always going to be the case once Rocket League professionalized to a level where orgs were doing the kind of in-person boot camp support and structures. Because now when you look at the list of players from Europe, like these are uh, the, the, the the structure of those teams has been there for a while, right? Like we've got the Vatira, uh, Alpha, Monkey Moon um, teams that are yeah. all competing against each other. And then like they're all just moving around in the same teams like if any of those french teams make a roster move in the off season there's no doubt it'll be a, a one-for-one trade with another french team or three players yeah. or switching places because why would you ever get any other player than the players who got the most experience the most wins are very good at the game and uh speak french so they can play play in your, in your system you know yeah i believe it's that i i was looking at it the other day because we were talking about it. i think it's only like 80 percent of all the like open era re- open era regionals in Europe have been won by like Monkey Moon, Alpha, uh, Seiko, and Zen. Oh, not Zen, uh, Vatira, sorry. Vatira, it's yeah. like, yeah, like, you know, obviously Monkey Moon won 10,000 of them during our LCSX, but then, you know, Vatira's <laughs> got eight, Zen and Alpha have four, uh, three, or Alpha's probably got four or five from our LCSX. Seiko obviously won a couple on Endpoint, a couple on BDS. So, yeah, they, they've, they've had a, a stranglehold over it, same way that, you know, First Killer and Atomic have had it in, in North America. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was good. I feel like we don't talk about the British scene enough in, in in the RLCS. It's like the most fascinating one to me by far because it's so big and there's so many players yeah. and they're all hilarious, which is just like <laughs> so good to me. So many like interesting personalities. Um, yeah, no. Yeah, it is uh, one of those things that you, you just end up like overlooking, like Wave said, you start naming off all the players like, oh, dang, okay, there is quite a so few. So many of them. Uh, in the UK scene. Well, um, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, that sounds like the uh, general consensus, you know, whether you hear it from French players or longtime community members. Farah has mentioned similar sentiments as well, like just having those idols early in the game inspired a lot of players. And then as Greg had mentioned, you know, you've got these players that are inspired and Wave talks about how they, they work hard, but then they've got these systems that they can jump right into that are just going to further fuel that that work ethic and drive. And so it's no surprise that they have... Uh, they have done quite well in recent times. I mean, I guess throughout the history of Rocket League Esports, actually. So we mm-hmm. are, are we are determining right now that UK is going to turn this over. At this point right now, they're going to turn it over, and they're going to start threatening the French, knocking them off the pedestal. They're you saying it's coming first. home. It's coming home. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's oh, do man. this. We've got, um, <laughs> we've got one final thing we want to throw at you guys, and <clears throat> let's do it like this. Um, first, we'll go to Wave. We got major scouting report. You guys are going to explain the strengths and weaknesses of each EU major team. Uh, we'll go with Wave. Talk to me a little about Carmi Corp. What do you think makes them so incredible? The best players. Okay, just that <laughs> simple. Yep. Well, like, like okay, <laughs> you you put, you put it like this, right? You look at the names on the team. Yeah. And it's obviously you've got. Vatera, who's pretty much been this, mm. the foothold of Europe for the past two years now. Yeah. And then, obviously, same with Rise, pretty much outside of one stint with Oxygen. 
and then Atar has been like around that point and there's always been yeah. he's never quite been at the top but has always competed for it mm-hmm. and outside of outside of vitality you don't see a better team with better names and like you right. can find like a player or two on other teams but not a trio that's comfortably sure. better than all of them and mm-hmm. i think that's it's sometimes as simple as it is they are just better yeah yeah i, I don't disagree i think it is funny when you say it like that but I think yeah, but it's also it's, not the entire story because we've seen some super teams form that maybe aren't at the same level as these three, but still they're three incredibly talented players. And yeah. then sometimes they just don't work together. So I think you need BDS, to have that synergy as well. I think BDS last season was a more, had like better players in terms of the talent and their resume, their pedigree, maybe not their current form than Vitality did at the time. Like no one before spring is taking redosin over any of those three right and then obviously they just took off and won everything sure. but i think it, i think with this case i think it's different just because the three of those those three on carmine they're all just like so dialed in they're like they're playing to their names right what do you think about that wave i don't know like i don't i don't necessarily agree with that because obviously if you look at it in perspective as of now 100 percent you could say that but if you go relative to the time that BDS was absolute junk. <laughs> and true. like they they got rising and then they became good. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. it's it's as simple as they were. Like they are good players. They didn't work. They they did work well at the start. They won worlds. They won almost three regionals in a row. They bottled spring major, but who cares about that when you win worlds? Like Yeah, no one. And then no after one. that, they did garbage for two splits. And then they got a new team and they, they were the only team that was competing with Vitality for the longest time. Yeah, yeah. I, I think they, I, I the, agree. The biggest factor for KC, I think, on top of everything Wave has said, is that they all play better under pressure. I think, um, mm-hmm. I think that's something that stands out. Like, I mean, obviously, we get to scrim against all these different teams, and like KC are amazing in every setting. But I think they're they're the team that they look better in tournaments than in practice, where most teams yeah. look better in practice than in tournaments. Um, there's a few other uh, examples of that, but I think they're the they're the one that stands out the most. Where like how many goals they score in clutch moments, you know, like mm-hmm. when they step it up in the when the backs against the wall, they they pull back that goal when the pressure's against them. Like they have that extra step up that comes out when the pressure's on. Yeah. And is that a team effort or is that all just individual talent? Like Wave said, I think that's the individuals, right? The individuals are all capable of stepping up in that big moment and creating something magical, you know. Well, it's not like it's not like it's exclusive to this team. Rise has done it wherever he goes. Atira has done it wherever he goes. I think that's um, a piece of what makes them so great. You know, it's not just their their mechanical ability with what they can do on ball off uh, on ball mechanically, but also just the way that they like approach competition in general. Um, they kind of have what I mean, and and I don't know these guys as well as you do, but they just it seems like they just have this killer mentality. You know, they, they don't shy away from that big moment. They want to be in that moment and, and do the best that they can. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, well, I mean, I agree. I think it's very, you know. Wait, quickly. Okay. If if they're, just quickly, if they, if Carmen Corp are going to lose for, like, reasons other than them just throwing, what do you think the best, just from your experience, what do you think the the way to make them bleed would be? Pray? Or, like, is there actually just actually a strat? Uh, I, I think their biggest weakness is they can sometimes get a bit over aggressive um, and they can get punished for that. Um, but I think most people panic so much with their aggression that they yeah. they can get away with it. Um, and I think if you if you're cool, calm under pressure and collect that ball, you can you can find ways to counterattack them. Um, but yeah, I think they they're part of this like modern play style where people do overcommit and just trust their their mechanical ability. They trust their teammates' calls or whatever it is. And I think they do it better than anyone where they, you know, they're doing all these fake plays, they're doing all these bump mm-hmm. plays and solo, like they, they have all the options and it looks like they knew what they were going to do before it happened because they know each other better than anyone and they trust each other's comms. Right. Let's jump to, let's jump to Team BDS. Greg, and what, uh, give us the strengths, weaknesses of BDS. Uh, strengths is they read the play super well, like a classic monkey moon team thing. So, uh, what you have to do is to, to punish that is be unpredictable. So you have to, um, you know, take these, these options that aren't the first ones that's obvious because they're going to be looking to read it 
um and when they do read it they'll punish you every time they'll intercept passes they'll um read your booms and all that kind of thing um and i think they just have such a good read of where each other is so they they can get these like one two touch boom goal and you're like so caught off guard by it so yeah like you you can't you can't outread them. Um, you you can try and outpace them, but most of the time they'll read better than you can pace. Um, so you have to try and be deceptive and use mechanics that are hard to read. Go for fakes. Go for uh, like unexpected plays and uh, and everything like that. And also play for the fifty because they're looking to read your touches rather than um, looking to uh, you know like outplay you. Right. Yeah. All right. Let's throw um, let's throw team vitality to Wave. Let's see what Wave says about that squad. Well, I think for them it's more like they're going into this LAN with the crown, right? Like mm -hmm. everyone's going to be trying harder against them because they are the, the world champions. And I think that's where it can affect some teams the wrong way. They're going to try too hard. Mm -hmm. They're going to push for this or that. And they've also got like Zen, like that, like <laughs> on top of like they got Zen. That's, that's the thing. That's the thing with some of these teams, right? Oh, like on BDS, like their win condition is Monkey Moon. And, like these teams have win conditions, and that's like that's what some of these. That's how they win. They you give the ball to this player, you let them do this, you let them do that, and they can win you games. And that's the same thing with Vitality. They have they have arguably more talent than BDS, sure. And I think they're coming off of a good regional for them, especially mm -hmm. a good, obviously the 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 crown from last season. And outside of KC on land, I don't see anyone else really beating them. Yeah, really. Yeah, I think, you think Vitality are better than BDS. I think BDS will crack. I don't think they'll do bad, but I don't see them beating. But apart um, from the last I, regional, Team Vitality haven't looked themselves at all this split now doesn't really matter you, you, you take recent recent form going into land you can you can play absolutely okay. you can play awful look at uh full major of last year moist with eu5 yeah fair enough bds didn't win a regional when they won the, the first fall major as well the sweden one yeah. they look worse than dignitas yeah exactly and, like, and, it, it, and, it doesn't matter how you do. and i'm sure wave is very comfortable with this but the land setting is i mean it is different than playing online and they have Zen. I think we should just say that again. <laughs> they have, they Zen. have Zen. They literally have Zen. All right. Well, a final Zen. EU team. A final EU team. We'll throw this over to Greg and Gentlemates. I am very interested to hear what you th think about this team. Um, obviously, three very talented players. But I'll just give my own perspective. When they formed, it's one of those teams that you know all three are very talented. You know that they can be good. But my question was, would they? Right? Because we talked about it earlier. Sometimes throwing three talented players doesn't really work. Um, all that well in practice. Mm -hmm. So, um, what what is your what's your analysis about the squad? Do you think that first event was a big time pop off? Do you think now they're kind of settling into more a more accurate performance for them? Um, talk to me a little bit about gentlemates. Yeah, they're, they're an interesting team because I do I think if you've got the talent of the top teams, I think they were solvable with the way they played, which is why I think they've uh, diminished in um, finishes since the the first one. Um, they have a very aggressive play style that's really annoying to play against for most teams. Uh, and I think it's, again, it's similar to what we said about KC of like when they're in your face, you, you make mistakes and then they keep it in your face. Whereas against like a stronger team that's, you know, got that star player who can just take control of the ball and be like, I don't care about what you're doing and then punish them for those decisions. I think they can, um they can get destroyed i think gentlemates are the kind of team which north american teams should be scared of you know when you hear this whole like oh you, you, in na you have loads of space so you can do all the, the cool mechanics yeah. i think if you're thinking of any team that represents that european aggression i think gentlemates are probably the team that represents that the best because they are in your face they're constantly challenging you um and they will punish teams like that um and i just think against maybe Maybe some of these European teams, maybe G2, maybe Falcons, if they're ready for it, they'll be able to deal with that pressure and punish them from that overcommitment and overaggression in uh, in their challenge game uh, and and get those counterattacks or punish them when they're on low boost from going over and over again. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that that's probably the main thing for them. And I think the top European teams have solved them a little bit, I think. Um, but they work very well against teams outside of the top, I think. Yeah. Well, let me throw one more, and then we'll move on to the final question for you guys. Do you think all four European teams go top eight? 
Um, I think if any of them don't, it would be BDS. Um, and I think that would be because of um, the fact that Drali is so inexperienced on LAN. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, Cassio as a coach is inexperienced on LAN, um, despite being a very good LAN player himself. And I think um, there's a potential for that kind of similar thing that's happened in the past for a team like BDS where it could go wrong. But I think if they can get over those early nerves, and I think Swiss as a format is one of the best formats to do that, sure, I think they yeah. should be fine, yeah. So what you're Wait. saying is Cassio should sub in for Drali. <laughs> <laughs> uh, more, more of the idea Ooh. of like, it's a, a, a lack of, you know, they haven't done that before, right? But yeah. But but honestly, like we've we've said that before about teams like Queso, and then you know they go sure. off and pop yep. off. So it's like it's 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 reaching for a reason, but I don't think mm -hmm. it's. I think yeah. they're the most likely to, but it doesn't mean they will. You know. Wave thoughts. I I would like to say all four of them would make it, but I think if yeah. any of them don't make it, it's gentle mates. Okay. I think gentle mates. I I think they're all like really good, but I think if they run into the wrong series of games. They could easily crumble compared to um, BDS. I think I think BDS will be quite comfortable going into top eight, but I think after that is when they'll struggle. Sure, sure. Yeah. And you know, sometimes Swiss will give you a pretty tough run. It can happen. Yeah. <laughs> some pretty experienced people in that department here. All sure. right. Well, we don't want to keep you guys too long. So, uh, final question here: expectations, thoughts moving forward for Split Two and beyond for Top Cougars. What can we expect from you guys um, in the future? Um, do you want to go ahead, Wave? Oh, yeah, easier Swiss runs, ideally, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, obviously, format um, side of things, we hope that as we climb through the seeds, we'll start to get rewarded for seeding, as it is a format that rewards uh, teams that have higher seeds. And so if you find yourself starting lower, you have to climb, and hopefully we yeah. can start, start that climb. But um, honestly, like, uh, it's not public knowledge, but for Regional 3... We were hoping to go to boot camp because um, I've got a lot of contacts across UK orgs um, and some of them were offering us some really good boot camp opportunities for big discounts. And we'd have loved to have done that. You know, me and Wave have been on boot camp before. We love we love a boot camp. Toxic Acro never been on boot camp. Um, so fingers crossed for it's a good experience for them. Second split, we can get that to work out and we can be maybe the first unsigned team to boot camp for, for a regional. I don't know. We'll see. Awesome. We're pulling for it, man. Yeah. Best of yeah, luck I, in Split Two. You uh, best of luck in Split Two. Thank you guys so so much for making some time to chat with us here uh, this evening, and, and y'all enjoy the rest of the night. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the the podcast. All right. Awesome segment there with Greg and Wade. We certainly appreciate them awesome. carving out some time for us. Let's move forward into a few segments before we close out the show. First up, we got spoiler alert. We are going to give you our team that we think could play spoiler to some others on their run at the major. Now, let me make this clear. This is not a prediction for these teams to win the event. This is a team that could play spoiler to some of your more serious contenders. Now, obviously, all these teams are trying their best to win. They all believe that they can, but only one can do so. Now, um, does anyone want to go first? If not, I will lead the way. Go ahead. Go first. Let's start okay. off. Let's start off I'm going to kick us off. I'm going to say OG Esports. Now, OG Esports has had a very interesting <clears throat> beginning of the season. I mean, just a, a, the slowest possible start that you could have outside of missing the event. Literally. They went 0-3 in the first qualifier, and then they, they make it back in, and they lose their first two in the Swiss of uh, qualifier two. So, I mean, their five series in RLC's main event for the season, their first five series were losses. Like, that's not good. That is not a good start. But I think... Them bouncing back shows something that that team is great at, and I think that is the maturity, the experience, the wisdom, um, and just overall good mentality as a team. They were, you know, I'm going to say leftovers from their other teams. They were never the superstar on their squads, but I want everyone to understand that doesn't mean that you're not good. That just means that you're maybe not the number one piece. You're maybe not the, the most flashy or... Uh, most mechanical on your team, but that does not mean that they're not good. Those are three players that played a um, an enabler style role. Obviously, they had different roles within their own team compositions, but they very much made their teams better. And you can see, I mean, an example is Nolly flying over to Europe, 
winning flip and spin with KC, a roster that he doesn't play with. You know, they're they're yeah. they're just players that you put them on a team and you you think, you know what? They're definitely going to contribute. They're definitely going to make their teams better uh, or their teammates better, excuse me. And the way that they play Rocket League is so fun to watch. They are so balanced. Uh, you know, pass heavy. They're very creative with the passes and the looks that they find with one another. So I think that could cause some problems for some of these teams if they're not ready for it. I do think, unfortunately, that some of the top tier teams are probably not going to give that OG squad the respect that they may deserve. And that could sneak up on them. So that's my pick for... Uh, yeah, I mean, oiling. listen to what uh, Relating Wave had to say. Like, it's it's all about current form. doesn't really mm -hmm. matter what you did in, yeah. that's right. in the first two uh, open qualifiers. Yeah. It's they've been the clear best, third best team in North America since yeah. that exact moment where they went to the O3 round. They've been cleaning <laughs> what, everybody up, basically. What like, a weird thing. It's like they yeah. split the switch on or something. I mean, you, you I see guess. the difference in JNAP's personal shift rating, um, octane mm -hmm. rating, whatever. And I think it was that they, start, they started to sort of, the play kind of ended with him because he's such a gifted and always has been such a gifted yeah. shooter. Yep. Um, and I think one thing that they said that I had noted was that Gentlemate specifically uh, as well as BDS, are very aggressive and are trying to read you. And I think a team like OG, who is so fine with just sitting back, keeping their composure, and then picking you apart in that moment, they could give those teams a ton of trouble. So I love yeah. that pick. I'm going to go with the boys from Down Under. Power. I think power Down Under. Play real, real, <laughs> real weird. Put some shrimp on the Barbie type stuff. What is um, blood waffling about? <laughs> I think, look, I think that the, the, the reason I think this team is spoiler is the confidence. One word, sure. confidence. They've swept their region. They they can take it one of two ways. Man, our region sucks, but they're not going to take it that way because yeah, they can believe not. in themselves, right? And then what they believe is that they dominated a split. And we've seen in the past to a greater level for from regions that are maybe a little more developed or have been developing at a faster rate, Mina yeah. and Sam with Fury and Falcons coming in after dominating their region and making a run yeah. off pure confidence. When Yan's, yeah. you know, pre-jumping off the ceiling at Worlds or, you know, Falcons are making that run in, in London, I think uh, we saw that the confidence they had in themselves because they were so dominant has led them to maybe overperform compared to other tournaments yeah. that they've played in, international tournaments, later on in their international careers. Um, and I think the same could be here for Power. They are a new team, technically, adding Banana Head, who I think has been the best player in OCE for a while now. And... I think that could lead to, especially early when teams are still getting settled in the lamb, maybe adjusting to time zones, them coming in, stealing a series, and and, and messing up the Swiss, setting a team down to that 0-1 round or that 1-2 round. I mean, um, you're talking could, about you know, confidence runs from dominant teams like Furia and Falcons. No, I'm not saying they're going top four, top two. I'm just saying that, that confidence could convey. Yeah, but even then, they were good teams in good re regions. I mean, no offense, but... <laughs> <laughs> they beat Australian teams. Yeah, but they don't think that way. What they think is we beat everybody. We haven't lost. I yet. don't oh. care what they. I don't care if they think that. Do way I think or they're not gonna? Good. Do I? I don't I, think I'm they wrong. have the level that they can play spoiler here. All I'm gonna Ugh. say is, at first killer teams have never been good round one. So you know, keep your eyes on. Keep your eyes on. The oh yellow yeah, they play Gen G. Yeah. They, I've they already seen a predict. I've already seen a prediction from a caster. Oh, a power over Gen G. I've already seen it. So, I mean, listen, would I put money on, on them to make top eight? No. But, you know, if they, if, I think early in that Swiss, when they're, when they're riding high and, and uh, a lot of the other teams maybe getting settled in, they yeah. could steal a series and really make things interesting. Yeah. They'll also have that factor of like, they'll, they'll also have that factor of, you know, potentially teams overlooking them or, or not giving them the right respect. And, and I think that, you know, it, it's easy to brush that off, but that stuff does play a role. Um, you know, if a power team goes out 1 0 over Gen G, the reality is they're going to feel a little embarrassed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they're just going to feel kind of embarrassed about that. So, And everyone else is going to be like, oh, wait. Yeah. You know, like, we got to lock in here. Uh, but yeah, oh. sorry. I couldn't hear what you were saying before. I heard you were looking for round five from power. Oh, if they see if they see one of those silly teams, Gentle Mates Complexity in round five, <laughs> watch that series. Because those are the type of teams that would just find a way, you know? But okay. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it's that that likely. So but we still, got OG. We got power. power. Yin. Who you got? I mean, rule one. I have okay. a decent chance at playing that kind of spoiler role. I yeah. mean, their first matchup against Gentlemates. That's already a series to look at. It's one of the most exciting series of the first round. But then afterwards, I mean, who knows if they can play some close close series? You know, gets to game five in in some of the rounds. 
then they can set up some matchups that's not that are not going to be easy for the top teams to to uh, take away from them. So I yep. think rule one. I mean, do I have to say it again? Lupo Nation. Do I really have to say it? <laughs> say it again. Lupo Nation, check. They have Lupo. They have, have Lupo. Lupo. <laughs> well, what they were saying about how if you have a player that doesn't care, right, about uh, the pressure and can just take it yeah. and go do something. Yeah, that's true. That's, that's true. What, you know, Greg and said that is gentlemates. And outside of maybe Zen and like Daniel and First Killer, outside of the European teams, is there anybody you'd want clearing the ball, like taking the ball out when the other team's overcommitted more than Lupo, who can do yeah. anything with his car? <laughs> I don't know. I yeah, don't know. that's that's a that's a good pick. Yeah, I like that pick as well. It's also a, a unique scenario, like you said, where they're they're like they're being overlooked. They're definitely being overlooked. Ama, all all focus is on Falcons, and there's not yeah. myself yeah. included. You know, there's not a lot of faith in that that's team. The to go top eight, they're so. the second uh, seed from their region, and yeah. yeah, maybe they are less strong. Maybe Falcons is just going to have a much better result at the major, but there's still a team that absolutely can beat some of the. Mm -hmm. Teams yeah. from the other regions yeah. that we haven't seen them come up against yet. That's yeah, a good pick. I like that. We also don't know how good Falcons are. Like, what if Falcons are a top three right. team in the yeah. world and Rule One are top six, and we just haven't seen yeah. them against? I wouldn't teams. go that far, but it's yeah, we don't know. Anything's yeah. possible. So there's our spoiler alerts. We are uh, yeah, spoiler picks. We've got OG Power and Rule One. I like those picks. We may not all be right, but I think one of us will be right yeah, somewhere me. along the board there. Let's go to our next segment here. Next up is, uh, excuse me, the next up rookie of the split. So obviously Shift has uh, published their next up report showing you and highlighting some upcoming and rookie players uh, this season. And we've got some nominees here that deserve a shout. Drolly for Team BDS of Europe. Wavy uh, on Team, uh, or TSM from North America. Swift on Ninjas in Pajamas in South America. Nupo on Rule 1 from Mina. And then Prompt, Ground Zero, Gaming, OCE, Sphinx, Elevate in APAC, and Guns on Shmongolia in SSA. Gens, why don't you kick us off on this one? I mean, ooh, my heart says one thing, mm. and my head says another. Yeah. My heart says Sphinx, but I have to go with Drali from Team BDS, because... To come in as a rookie player who has had some experience, you know, going sure. to flip and spin was nice um, for for some LAN experience, but of course it's not RLCS. Um, but coming onto a team with the name and yeah. the players of Team BDS, I mean, that's an incredible achievement if you then make, manage to make a, a good split out of that. And he definitely made a good split out of that. I'm going to go next because, um, I mean, my answer is the same. It's Drolly, and it's so incredibly impressive. Like, Nupo deserves a shout. Rookie, major, that's fun. That's awesome. Sphinx as well. I think that's incredible. All these guys ha have, have been, uh, you know, a big piece of their team, finding the success that their team has found. But, man, I mean, Europe is obviously a very strong region to compete in. As you mentioned, Jens, BDS has an, an incredibly um, successful legacy to uphold. And that is a team that, I mean, I, I remember our first one. I was not sold, right? I was talking about them and Gentlemates. Are they really yeah. going to be what everybody's making them out to be? Are they really going to be know. on the level with Vitality and KC? And my word, Drolly just has performed to a level that I just had no expectation of, you know? Um very consistent. I think it's always so impressive when a player uh, assimilates into a system so flawlessly. Zen last season uh, with Vitality and now Drolly with, with BDS. We heard Greg and earlier talking about the way that they play, kind of that monkey moon cerebral style, and Drolly just fits right in alongside him and uh, Exotic. So got to go with Drolly there for Team BDS in Europe. And That's it, my, it, my rookie. It's hard. Play. It's yeah. hard to, to to play such a, a a sort of tactically focused style like that as a young player, right? You don't have the experience right. and the reps and the and the adjustment to the speed mm -hmm. that uh, you know other players do. And so for him to be able to slide in and play a style that is very anticipatory when he hasn't even he, doesn't, he might not even know what to anticipate at the, <laughs> at the highest level. You know, you don't even know if he knows that yet. It's pretty it's pretty awesome to see that he's done that. Um, I'm actually going to go away from that though, even though I think Drolly's okay. been fantastic. Um, 
I'm going to, I'm going to take strengths on this one. Um, mm. And Get the reason why is, is Sphinx better, a better player than Drawley? I would say no. Maybe. But, yeah, we don't know yet. We'll see. <laughs> but maybe it can be. But at the moment, yeah. that, that's a hard claim to make. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I won't go that far. Let's say that. Um, but I think in terms of relative to their region, that's right. I think Sphinx had the greatest impact on winning mm-hmm. because he won more. Um, I think that you know coming into a a region that was, you know, kind of predetermined by many to be a one team region. Oh yeah. And making such a difference with two players who had done well, you know, LCT made a, um, made a major last year and made worlds. And, and Kevin has always been around the top of APAC, just under the top, top teams. Um, and winning the majority of, of the regionals. I mean, you know, and, and when we talked to Kevin, he said that he was in the backpack, right. And when you watch them, they're very Sphinx centric, right. So they handed him the keys immediately. They said, you are the best player on this team. We're not going to sit here and play pecking order because we played for longer. Go ball. And he did that exactly. He answered the call and, you know, he he got them to land off that style of, of letting him make plays. Yeah. Um, I think it's impressive to do, especially when you're not playing on servers that are as populated with high level players yep. to get that good is so impressive. Right. Yep. Um, and I think he had the, as I said, he, I think he had the biggest impact on his region, though Drawley made a made a final was obviously incredible. I want to shout out Swift as well. I think he went a little under the radar because of how good the two teams and Sam were, but they were right there till the end. They beat complexity in that third open qualifier, I believe. And they were, you know, they just ended up on furious side of the bracket. But um, to me, Sphinx, I think he represents a lot of optimism in the APAC region. I mean, you're getting, you're seeing them getting shouts on beating pioneers. And last year, the APAC team getting a series at land at all was considered a joke. And now, you know, people are seriously seeing them, you know, when taking one, it's, it's a, it's a fashionable pick. Um, I think that's because of him. And, you know, I think that that deserves the rookie of the split mention, even if, you know, comparatively, he might not be on sure. that level relative to the well, region. He's been the best player in the region. Well, it is, it, it is a different scenario, but, and, and, you know, we could argue back and forth about our debate, which is harder, but I mean, you, you, like you said, that, that region was widely accepted as a one team region, um, myself included. You know, I think you saw yeah, what too. Bert and um, Bert and Realize accomplished at Wildcard for Worlds, and how you know how could you not think that that was probably going to be yeah. the team representing that region, right? And so to see Sphinx walk in in his first split alongside two, you know, LCT as you mentioned had gone to the major, but Kevin, kind of a you know a, a, an ascending player, yeah. and to jump right in and grab that spot, winning most of the regionals, that's and incredible. You're impressive. right, Michael. It's shout out to to Sphinx teammates as well because yeah. they've given him the opportunity they've made him they, they believed in him and made him the zen of the region basically yeah. right you, you can tell like you could tell yeah, by the way can. they talk about him that they're that they have no qualms with just letting him do what he can because you know and that and that's the coaches the the other players like some of these players come in and they, they have to sit behind other players and then you get these you know weird team environments but yeah you know, they, yeah. they gave him the keys from the start and he, and he proved them right. And we've seen it again and again in Rocket League. It's such a mechanical game that yeah. rookies are even more important than in any other esports that I've followed. Because if you have the mechanics like Sphinx does, you can just instantly get propelled to the top and be the best player in the region in the case of Sphinx. Yeah. Big shout out to all of the rookie nominees. Uh, next up, rookie of the split nominees. Drolly, Wavy, Swift, Nupo, Prompt, Sphinx, and Guns. Um, incredible stuff and all the other names as well that are making their first main event. Now we, and, just uh, last weekend, we uh, released another uh, scouting report for the Next Up campaign. So it covers a couple of the main stories from the rookies from the first split. Be sure to check that out. Shift um, RLE. R-L-E dot G-G. There That's you go. It. All right. Final segment of the day, speed taking. And we, this is going to be a, a forever pursuit to actually do speed taking. Yeah, let's go, let's go, let's go. We, uh, yeah, <laughs> we might need to rename it words slow taking or something. I don't know. Yeah. All right. Um, M- mildly pace taking. Let's do this. I think I have thrown some around. I think Michael has thrown some around. We'll give it to Yens this time. You can throw the takes around at us, uh, and, and we'll we'll give our let's uh, opinion on it. Let's just hit you, Hoodie, with something that's close to your heart. Okay. The main problem with Moist is coaching. Uh, the main stunned, problem? Stunned him. 
Well, I had to think for a moment because I didn't even know who their coach was, but it's Noah. Noah, yeah. Yeah, I had to think for a minute. Um, but I think the first, take is more about, not so much about Noah himself, but more sure. about what it's it yeah, should be done with the team. Yeah, like, saying. should they change the player? Should they go mm. for a different strategy to a different play style, basically? I'll say yeah. I'll say yeah. I think it's difficult to tell from the outside looking in. Obviously, we don't know what the coach does, and obviously each coach is going to have their own style. And as somebody that did coach, a big determining factor with how impactful the coach can be is the player's willingness to listen. Yeah. And I don't know if those players want to hear anything. You know, I think the reality is sometimes a team of three very talented individuals will grab a friend of theirs because they don't really want to be pressed. Do you know what I'm saying? And I'm not, I don't miss, don't, don't, don't take this as me You're not saying that's or being negative is. or anything. Yeah. This is a system that we operate in. If I was 16 and I was the best in the world at something, I might behave the exact same. Okay. But I would. <laughs> uh, 100%. I, 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 yeah, what I, I think, again, from a fairly ignorant perspective, I think it's fair to say yes. And the reason why is because look at the freaking talent on that team. I know that there is, you know, wavering opinions about Joyo, but that sucker is one of the best players in the world. No doubt in my mind. He is incredibly, incredibly capable on ball, potentially like a top three player on ball in the world. Yeah. Um, now, there, there's more to the game than just on ball, but uh, that, yeah. that freestyle background is unbelievable. Very obvious. Um, and then Oli and Rezzy, I think, are both very incredible mechanically as well. Now, we've yeah. talked at length right. in so many different ways about how mechanics alone is not going to do it, which would lead me to assume there's got to be something that we can improve tactically or environmentally. You know, maybe they don't deal well with losses. That's definitely something that a coach can help. Maybe, um, you know, maybe we're not super focused in scrims. I, I don't know. Again, I, I don't know what is all going on, but I think I'll give it a yes. Yeah, and yeah. there is our long delayed not speed take. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the real I think problem it's, it's was Cash who um, who said that Joyo might be the most mechanical player in the world at the moment, which is quite a take. But yeah. you know, if take. you have a player like like uh, Joyo on that team, I mean, you got to do something with it. Yeah, the fact that he's in the discussion is a, is enough, in my opinion, right? Like you've got a player like that, and you've got two others that are. It's not like they're slouches. It's not like they're, you know bums <laughs> they're both very good as well so i mean Rezzy had an incredible spring split yeah. at the end of last season and Oli obviously bounced back as well with g1 so yeah i don't know i mean i it, yeah i'll go with yes i know I'll what the issue yes. is the issue is regional twos Rezzy, we need to figure out what's going on regional in the second specifically huh he he no, hogan mode he goes top six <laughs> yeah. misses the regional goes top three moisey goes top eight misses the regional top four if we can figure out what the heck he's doing during regional twos <laughs> So well, there. He's I mean, it's, just, it's a simple coaching solution, then I guess just solve Sub that regional up. two problem. Sub them up. Bring Astral only for lands and find someone else for regional twos. Five man roster. Okay, we're winning everything. Okay, Michael, J Naps won't retire until he wins the world championship. Um. Well, I'd love to that for that to be the truth. You know, guys know I love Jacob Nabman with all my heart. Um. I don't think so. Um. I think let's be realistic. Players will not retire until they're no longer paid a monthly salary to play the game. Um, I think, you know, a lot of the time people will say, oh, they're squandering their legacy. And I kind of agree. But at the same time, if someone is going to continue paying you until... Yeah. I could not like, care less. Why would you not? You know, you, yeah. you like if you enjoy the game, if you enjoy competing, right. you know, you're going to continue to do it if you're getting paid. Uh, I think we've seen it with Squishy, who, you know, was very transparent in that this was his last split because he did not get signed to an org. Um, and we saw with Turbo where he was on Dark Zero for two splits. And then once he was released, he retired. Uh, so I think Jane Apps is going to keep playing, even if he wins a world championship, as long as someone's going to pay him. And, you know, credit to him. He's not scamming them. You know, yeah, he's uh, I think there was a lot of question. There were questions right. about the OG team and he answered them. You know, I think he's been, you know, their best player since they've taken off. So, you know, 24 years old and he is the best player on a major team. Uh, I think he's given, he's earned the right to, oh, I see Hootie's upset. He's repping for the 90s, babies. Come on, the 90s kids. <laughs> That's right. We, we need to get him a 99 It's a jersey. dying breed uh, at the professional we, level. We man. are not done with breed. the 90s yet. We are not done with the 90s yet. Don't listen to NBA TikTok. Um, <laughs> but 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think he'll stop playing when they stop paying him. And I, yeah. I would do the same thing. So no hate at all. Absolutely would do the same thing. And all the people telling them they're squandering legacy, y'all can frick right off. That is, yeah. that's trash. Yeah. Exactly. What, what, listen here. Turbo on Dark Zero does not matter. He still won four and he's still one of the most successful players. Well, he's the most successful player that we've had. It doesn't matter what he did at Dark Zero. It doesn't matter. Play. No one's going to remember that. They're going to remember right. no, him it does, and, 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 and if you do, it don't matter. It don't matter. Um, but yeah, Jens, I got a question for you. Go for it. So speaking of Turbo and, and, and his legacy, uh, the take I got for you is the league play era has become underrated when talking about legacy slash goat talk. Underrated? In, in what sense? That people value the open era far more and people discredit maybe the league play era because of the uh, perceived lack of competition that came with a fixed amount of players. A fixed I don't think of that was yeah, very well worded. Very well worded. It is very well worded. Um, it, it's more about the constant change in play style and in, in improvement. And I think that's what changes the conversation more than whether there were less games played or like more opportunities for upsets in an open system. I, I think the real issue with this GOAT talk is that these, these times, these league play era times were so different in how they were, how players were valued, how teams were valued, just because the mechanics were so completely different um, that every play just right now looks so slow and so uninspired because the level of competition has risen so much that it's incredibly hard to compare anything just two years apart, let alone five years, right? Yeah. So, uh, or yeah, what is it, four years? I guess it's been four. It's 20, 2020, right? Because yeah. It was during the pandemic when yeah, LCSX right. started. So yeah. four years. But I mean, I think that's a bigger issue uh, than the, the number of games being played. Because you could also argue it the other way around that um, if you have less games, fewer games to have played, then you need to show up for every single game. Yeah. Uh, you cannot lose anything or you're just down at the bottom of, of the rankings so uh no I, I i is it underrated i i don't know how people rate it maybe maybe more people should appreciate what those old players and old teams could do but i think it's just incredibly hard to compare in general right yeah that's what well put that being said monkey moon is the best player there we go. Figured it out. There you go. Um, but yeah, Hoodie, let me let me get one over to you then. Tell me another one. Um, and this one, you know, let's go a little off script here. Let's, let's okay. take a break from RL, right? Here's my okay. take for you is that cold showers are underrated. Absolutely. Absolutely. Ball They're wonderful. Ball um, they are just, I mean, well, they're just effective. Like they wake you up. They give you a jolt of energy. Uh, you know, there, there's all kinds of like studies and science that show there are many benefits. With that said, uh, I prefer warm showers. <laughs> I just love the warm water. One every once in a do, while. I don't want to do it. There's a lot of things that I know are good for me that I skip, and that's going to be one of them. I mean, why me not? Turn it. Every <laughs> once in a while, it hits so good, but I don't know how people do it every day. <clears throat> why every can't day. you just take showers that are comfortable? Why does it have no, to be no, scorching after, hot or after a cold mine are, shower? Mine are comfortable. Yeah, I don't go scorching hot. But I feel like I like shower. warm. I don't want it to be. Yeah, cold. yeah, yeah, exactly. The, the, I don't want to be. Do, 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 do. I don't want to do that. It's insane. Like getting out of a shower and your body's radiating heat after a cold shower. So good. But yeah. that being said, sometimes you just want to sit in the shower for a little That's bit. That's right. Think and you Got can't. Got music going. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's a quick one. Easy. And then... I'll, I, I, I'll throw I'll throw it at you two guys. Um, Michael, Gingy's fall performance in 2022, 2023, fall major performance, excuse me, was the most visually entertaining Rocket League play style ever in Rocket League. No. No. 
Um, it was fun. And I think that they pioneered a lot of what's very popular now mm-hmm. um, with the sort of mixture between the all out pressure and a lot of counter attack. It was just like the perfect yeah. fusion of the NA yeah. style that they were competing against and the EU style that they had come from where the majority of the roster came from. Um, but I mean, I, th- I can think of the very next major. I think the two teams in the final played a more interesting, or sorry, yeah. the winter major 21, 22 G2 with their passing and their, sure. you know, all that stuff was, and obviously moist with just like, you know, sending the house every time they could and just trying to overwhelm Absolutely. you was a lot of fun. I think season nine's G2, where they were the first team to really balance that classic G2 style with a lot of bumps and demos. That was the first time you really saw a team go for a bump, then an infield pass, then bam, mm-hmm. um, as opposed to some of the more counter attacky demo styles from teams like SSG. That was a blast to watch. Um, I think, you know, obviously you got to shout out Cloud9, you know, inventing mechanics. Uh, for some reason, yeah. no one had tried that yet, but that was for the time, by far the most entertaining play style, you know, ever ended yeah. became Darlings because of it. And then I think, Absolutely. Um, I think Vitality last year uh, in their back half played yeah. such a, in, like a, 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 like a beautiful game. Like it yeah. was just, you know, everyone's on the same page, you know, we're making the right play every time. Mm-hmm. So I think Gen G was fun to watch, but I also think it does kind of count that that major felt a little weird. It is an anomaly major where a lot yeah. of the players yeah. that are always at the on those champ Sundays just didn't make it uh, that or in beautiful. that final four, I should say. Right? You had Secret, Moist, which were EU5 at the time and had Astral, Gen.G, and FaZe. Um, so FaZe is the only kind of like mainstay team that was there. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I would say no, but you know they were a good time to watch. And, and it was All right. a, a period. That you I'll heard watch. it. Michael said it's a Mickey major. Oh, yeah. No, I'll actually go on record. It was a Mickey major. I don't care about that major at all. Like, I, I it just didn't. It's not. It was that, not. That, that's such a subjective question, too. It's like, what do you value as far as yeah. watching? I, I, I love chaotic full send, like queso when, when they were popping the liquid. Plays. I love that, man. It's so, so much fun to watch. But all right, final take say here. for you one when they were really good. You won. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. But that was I also because Calm was just pissing everybody else. Yeah, that, that wasn't was fun. Two teammates but yeah, that was that's, awesome. that's right. There are different things that are that we can appreciate and enjoy watching. All right, Yens. Juicy one. Every EU NA series on LAN at this major will be won by a European team. Oh, I would be really surprised if that happens. Uh, really? Does that just mean that G2 is not meeting any European teams the entire major. I mean, I don't maybe. Well, I that. mean, what what if what if G two only runs into KC? Yeah, yeah, it's possible. Um, but no, just okay. in terms of statistical likelihood, sure. <laughs> likelihood, <laughs> I'm gonna say. What's your heart say, Yids? We need the drama. No, but I mean, uh, let's just look at what Relating Wave just said earlier yeah. again. Yeah, it, recency. That that's what matters, right? So let's all get really recency biased over here and look at Gen G winning that regional. Oh, I yeah. Mean, let's talk about Gen G. How about it's that? Not let's, a one, let's do a little Gen G talk. How, apparently, how it's not a one team region anymore, yeah. NA. So maybe Gen G can throw something in there and, and just oh. beat a European team. I can see it. I can see it. Scheduled first killer flogging of Monkey Moon is coming. You guys just wait. <laughs> Once a year, I get to just watch it, and it's all its glory. And I, I mean, of it. course, I get to gloat if it doesn't ha- if it doesn't happen. If NA of just course. does not get any wins. Oh, I see it. what's going on here. You you you're playing both sides. So if no, NA he's, wins, he's, so he's saying no. He, okay. This is a classic sports pundit take <laughs> where you say something's not going to happen, thinking it will, so that you can be like, "But I trusted them." Yeah. All right. No. <laughs> I don't like this. No, I I don't think EU is that far above the rest yep. that they won't yeah i mean that's fair surely loss. one surely mm-hmm. one surely sure when will happen surely. for na please please <laughs> please we please. need it surely surely I, I, no, yeah. no, no. And but if not I actually, we'll just have a big old grin on his face yeah. <laughs> i try i tried to believe i mean I'd, I'd hope not as well because it would be very difficult to get good interviews with north american players is if all they do is losing. Yeah, so that's uh, true. That's true. I want a little bit of a mix in there. And uh, yeah. let's hope we get some some good matchups. We, I've been too. The way. community needs it too. I mean, the argument would be oh, yeah. difficult to continue. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna, that's my, that's my guess. Yeah. I'm going to go five, five and two, European North America. 
I like uh, it. Europe yeah. to sure. to NA, and those two NA will be Gen G in the semifinals against Vitality, and Gen G in the finals versus. <laughs> Jason. Uh, Come on, Jason. What are we doing here? Oh man, oh, that's God. a take right there. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna clip that one. Off Hold right. on to Off it. Right. Oh, I hope he's not right. <laughs> Can't stand being I'll on buy the, a jersey. the podcast. I'll buy a jersey every week with this happen. guy. And I'll wear it for the whole split. All the podcasts are split. I'll wear the same Gen G jersey. I think I, if Gen G win, retire. buy a Gen G jersey and wear yeah. it for the rest of the season. Yeah. For these podcasts. I will. All right. One hundred percent. That's fair. It's on record now. It's in. It's on it's record. Lando, okay. you hear that? Here you go. All right. Well, I'll hold you to it for sure. All right. I mean, I, I'm. I love it. Na winning the major would definitely ignite. Well, I mean, I guess the already existing discussion, but it would certainly reinvigorate it. Uh, it will make me the most annoying person on planet Earth. It, uh, dude, the NA, dude, Na fans <laughs> will be insufferable, and I, I, I'm from there. Yeah. I will. It will be miserable, dude. It'll be so bad. <laughs> Um, okay, gentlemen. Uh, I don't know if this if the shift cast can be salvaged. Yeah, yeah. No, it's actually perfect now that I'm thinking about it because Jack plays for Gen G, so that it'll be sure. They're so look look copium. Yeah. When's yeah. the last? Yeah, and, it's been two years since a uh, all NA team won a major. <laughs> and I remember, <laughs> I remember screaming my my lungs out. Chronics European. Chronics <laughs> <laughs> European. I remember nah, when nah. Um, didn't, wasn't he born. No, no. Someone made up a rumor oh, that he was born, okay, born okay. Memes, and everyone just ran memes. with it. It was great. Everybody, yeah. I, dude, that's what I was going to say. Everybody, obviously, at the time, I didn't know if it was rumor or not. I didn't give much weight to it anyways. But, um, yeah, I remember when that exploded. That is, is really funny now that it's just made yeah, up. Yeah, it's all memes, but it's, it. it's really good. <laughs> good times. Yeah. Great times. Okay. Well, that's going to conclude our, our segments. Anybody have any, any closing thoughts here um, before we take off? Yeah, guess who dropped 25 points in their men's league? Bank? You dropped 25? Listen, it was a four-point game at half. Things were getting a little chippy. And I said, listen, it's time to go. A couple threes, a couple layups, a fadeaway. And all of a sudden, the game's wide open. They couldn't hold me, man. I mean, also, Bro. they didn't have as many players as us. But yeah, listen, they I still got it a little bit. I still have it a little bit, okay? But 25 yeah. is balling. Yeah, no. It's they, league it was, or not, it don't matter. Heater. Like, that's... I, it, it, we were on a heater. And uh, so, yeah, big, next round, we're there. Okay. And uh, yeah, continue the journey. Hopefully, our major recap podcast will be with me with the trophy. So we can let's go. That. Let's go, nice. Michael. I am leaving for Copenhagen in one week when you nice. are watching this, if this is released um, on Wednesday morning. Uh, my flight leaves at 9 55. And the airlines I'm flying with are on strike until Wednesday morning. Brutal. Well, you know, thankfully, I've learned from the brother. community. <laughs> I've learned from the community that Europe has nonstop bullet trains across, which is why all the yeah. boot camps. So I'm you can just sure hop there's on a train one of the from your house to the venue. I think exactly. <laughs> I have done. I have done from where I live, Antwerp to Copenhagen by train. I've done it before. See? It takes thirteen hours. Oh, well, we can that's do a rough. podcast while you're on the train. That's rough. <laughs> I mean, if. <laughs> If I'm making my way to the airport and my flight hasn't been cancelled yet, there is no way I'm making it the same day. But I'm I'm leaving on Wednesday, so even if it's delayed by a yeah. day or even two, I still be able to do my job and get all the interviews in. So it's all good. But I also want to go to the HLTV confirmed live podcast, which is on Wednesday evening. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm going on Wednesday. Um, but yeah, my flight hasn't been cancelled yet. So let's see how that goes. All right. But hopefully, uh, hopefully it all runs smooth. That's the, excitement coming up in the next week i'll be Trip nation if you guys see a yens at the major if he's doing an interview leave him alone but if he's not go say hi and tell him of course genji's gonna win a mate yeah <laughs> i have to hear it from other people as well to believe it <laughs> incredible well yens have a great time be safe with your travels actually i guess we'll probably chat again next week won't we yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll have another episode going live before uh, all right before we got one more one more episode before Major go. Uh, Michael, incredible performance, man. 25 points. That's seriously insane. That's actually so good. Yeah, no. But that's going to that's gonna conclude ShiftCast episode eight. Can y'all believe we're eight episodes in now? I know. It doesn't. It was like just yesterday that we started, and I couldn't figure out. Yeah. 
Double Digit will be the major recap. And they're all on go. Spotify now. Yeah, Ooh, they're all on no, Spotify. Go. Make sure you go get that on Spotify. There well, you on go. Spotify, we've got the um, the QR code on Twitter. If you follow on on Twitter, you can check it out there. It'll give you a, a direct route to it. Yeah, um, links on there as well, but you can just look it up on Spotify. Shiftcast, it should be the first result. And uh, leave us a rating because we need those. Yeah. Five stars, please. Five stars, please, and thank you. Also, join the shift cord. Get in there, drop your takes. We might, uh, we might grab your take for speed taking. Appreciate you all listening. Hope you have a wonderful rest of the day, and we'll catch you next time.